this second video on rocket propulsion design equations, we'll cover the Tchaikovsky rocket equation in more detail. The Tchaikovsky equation merely describes how much propellant mass, MP, also shown here as delta M, the mass that would leave the back of the rocket, with a known combustion exhaust gas exit velocity, that's shown here, is required to affect the desired change in a rocket's velocity, this delta V, with a fixed structural mass, MR. That would be the, the fixed structural mass of the rocket. Now, a full derivation will be provided after a brief history description of events leading to the development of the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. Moving on with our brief history of rocket science, we make it to rows two and three, where we start off with novelists, a filmmaker, a teacher, and physicists. But in a key pivotal role, we see Jules Verne. Jules Verne inspires future generations via science fiction. And in fact, his book, From the Earth to the Moon, was read by all the key figures shown on this page by the age of 15. Jules Verne's book, From the Earth to the Moon, starts with a capsule, the Columbia, or a projectile that he'll launch using gunpowder as a combustible propellant. And we see the capsule here. Um, if we look at some striking similarities between uh, where the access door will be located for Verne's Columbia, versus the Apollo 11 Columbia, shown here, we see that, that they're in a strikingly similar location. Additionally, uh, these two uh, capsules are drawn to scale, and they're within a few feet of each other with respect to length and diameter. Another striking similarity is mass. If we look at um, the weight that, uh, for the projectile that Vern lists for his Columbia, it's around 19,000 pounds. The Apollo 11 crew module is just over 20,000 pounds without propellant. So very, very striking similarities. Another thing that Vern seems to get right is he picks a launch site in the United States based on a low latitude. So he can get that eastward facing kick uh, due to Earth spin, um, that 411 meters per second of velocity that you would get at a latitude for Tampa, Florida. Now, comparing that to what Kennedy Space Center um, has for a latitude at 28.57 north, that's 408 meters per second. So he's only about a meter and a half off the eastward facing uh, velocity that's used for uh, current day rocket flight. Verne creates the genre of science fiction by adding scientific concepts and calculations to support his fiction. Now, if we recall from part one of this lecture, uh, the scenario of Newton's canon, a few of the important uh, parameters we're going to need to calculate the, ex the acceleration of the Columbia as it leaves the, uh, uh, the cannon barrel is the cannon barrel length and the exit velocity. In this case, it's the escape velocity that uh, Verne has given us. So now, recall from those equations that the acceleration for the uh, the cannonball, or in our case, the Columbia, as it leaves the uh, the cannon barrel is gonna be that exit velocity squared divided by 2L. So now, if we take the escape velocity, or the exit velocity is 11,000 meters per second, uh, the length of the cannon barrel is 274 meters, and the acceleration given here, what we end up with is an acceleration of 220,803 meters per second square. Now, if we take 1G, and we divide that into that acceleration, what we end up with is a factor of 22,517 times larger than gravity. This is what the, um, the astronauts inside the Columbia would have had to have experienced as a peak acceleration uh, on their way to the moon. So an initial question after reading from the Earth to the moon is, is Verne's space gun possible to file a projectile into space? And the answer is yes. Um, the HARP space gun or high altitude research project cannon was used on November 18, 1966 in Yuma, Arizona to fire a 180 kilogram projectile at a exit velocity of 2100 meters per second. And it, it, it did pass the carbon line. It made it into space at a record altitude of 180 kilometers. But remember, this 2100 meters per second is not fast enough to reach escape velocity. In fact, it's not even fast enough to reach a parking orbit. So it did pass the Kármán line. It does technically make it into space, but um, this effectively can't make a parking orbit or, or would not make it to the moon. Now, if we look at the amount of Gs 
um, the projectile experienced, we calculate that over here at the right. And we see that's near 11,000 Gs, even for a, a, de a device or a projectile just to pass the Kármán line. Let's recall, Vern gives us an escape velocity or, or a muzzle exit velocity of 11 kilometers per second. And when we calculate that with the dimensions he gives us for his cannon, we end up with a 22,517 times larger acceleration than gravity in order for his Columbia projectile to make it from the surface of the Earth to the moon. Vern ignites interest in the prospect of space travel and exploration using science fiction as a medium. All the figures shown on the bottom row after reading the book from the Earth to the Moon ask the same question. Is 22,517 Gs too large an acceleration for human survivability? Konstantin Tchaikovsky was an early researcher who used scientific method by building a centrifuge with chickens as test subjects to explore G-loads on physiology. Tchaikovsky accelerated chickens at only a few Gs to cause disorientation and unconsciousness coupled with a high degree of stress and anxiety. As such, he noted, 22,000 Gs is probably too high for human survivability. Modern day astronauts train on centrifuge equipment to simulate the high G loads of space flight similar to Tchaikovsky's original design. Now, around 9 Gs is the max acceleration a trained pilot or astronaut with a G suit can sustain for short durations. Tchaikovsky publishes The Exploration of Cosmic Space in 1903, where he describes the use of a rocket using liquid hydrogen and oxygen as combustible propellants to provide a gradually increasing acceleration to promote human survivability. Over the next decade, Tchaikovsky proposes improvements to his original 1903 rocket design concept to make rocket launch acceleration possible for safe human transportation to park in orbits and beyond. During this period, Tchaikovsky is a full-time Russian mathematics teacher and part-time scientific author. Tchaikovsky also published science fiction stories focused on spaceflight over the course of his lifetime. Tchaikovsky's rocket concept is compared here with a free body diagram. Now the fixed mass of the rocket is shown along with the propellant, and we note that it's equal zero. The initial condition is mass of the rocket plus mass of the propellant. Now this would also correspond to an initial velocity, which could be due to um, uh, ground velocity due to Earth's rotation or in a parking orbit. So this would be considered the initial condition before ignition of propellant. Now, the final condition would mean all propellant is expelled, and then we would end up with that initial velocity plus a delta V. Delta V can be expressed as Tchaikovsky's rocket equation that describes the amount of propellant required to change the initial velocity of a fixed structural mass rocket. A free body diagram is shown as a methodology to solve Tchaikovsky's rocket equation. If we look on the left-hand side at the initial condition, what we're left with is the initial mass is the structural mass of the rocket plus the mass of the propellant. Next, we look at the initial velocity, which could be due to Earth's rotational speed at a given latitude, or could be due to the velocity of a parking orbit. Now, if we look at the initial momentum, it's just gonna be m times v naught. If we go to final condition, what we note is the final mass is m minus delta m where delta M is equivalent to the mass of the propellant that's been expelled. So now, if we look at the final momentum, um, we need to actually equate or, or account for the propellant that's been expelled. Now, because the propellant is moving in an opposite direction than the, than the uh, motion of rocket travel, we need to actually use Newton's third law and account for the force of the propellant that's been expelled inside this free body diagram. So by doing that, we're left with this term for momentum. Now, if we simplify that particular term, we're left with this result. Now, we'd like to equilibrate the initial momentum and final momentum and further simplify that result. We then divide both sides by M to get the equation in terms of delta V. Now that we're in terms of delta V, we'd like to perform integration on the right side of this equation. 
So we set up the integral using Newton's calculus and carry through the result. So now that we have this integration result, let's simplify it further. As our final step, we'll substitute the initial mass is the mass of the rocket plus mass of the propellant, and the final mass is just the mass of the rocket. And we're left with the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. The Tchaikovsky rocket equation is shown here, and I provided an alternate solution that's very similar to that shown on the, the past few slides, with the exception that I waited to apply Newton's second and third laws until just prior to the integration. Um, you end up with the same result for the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. And I also wanted to note these two terms are equivalents of the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. It's just the terms rearranged. Now, this one's very useful because most of the time you're gonna see the vertical axis in terms of uh, mass of rocket plus mass propellant over mass rocket. And you're gonna see the uh, horizontal axis in terms of delta V, the change of velocity over the exhaust exit velocity, which is shown here. So this is a very uh, useful term moving forward. The major insight for the Tchaikovsky rocket equation is shown here. And it's really when we break down this delta V over VE in that two to three range. So if we look at the bounding box on this graph uh, between two and three on the horizontal axis, what that's telling us is that the change in rocket velocity uh, has to be between two and three times the uh, propellant exhaust exit velocity. So we need to carefully choose our propellant uh, to give us that, that final speed uh, within two or three of what we'd need for either a parking orbit or escape velocity. Now, if we look at the vertical axis, it's got that massive rocket plus mass propellant over mass rocket. What I've done on the right in the table is I've constructed um, a box around that uh, delta V over VE of two and three. I've normalized the weight of the rocket or the, the mass of the rocket, the structural mass to one kilogram. And what we noted, it, if we were at a delta V over VE of two, we'd need 5.39 kilograms of propellant for every one kilogram of uh, rocket mass that's accelerated to this velocity. Now, the same thing is true when we look at three, that's telling us we need 19.1 kilograms of propellant for every one kilogram of rocket mass that's, that's accelerated to three times the exhaust velocity. So, um, this is an interesting table. It's a really nice takeaway. I think the other thing to look at is let's look at the percent of mass propellant uh, that we'd actually have here. So this is telling us that when the rocket takes off, if we're at a delta V over V of two, that 86.5% of the rocket is propellant at takeoff. Now for the delta V of three, that means 95% of the mass of the rocket is propellant at takeoff. That leaves only 5% for structural mass and payload. So this is the tyranny of the rocket equation um, that so much of the rocket is propellant at takeoff and very little is structural mass. For the sake of completeness, I've included a third way to solve Tchaikovsky's rocket equation. There are many, but this is actually my favorite because it's very compact. Now we start with Newton's second law of motion uh, and which is written in, in this format. We note that in the future, the sum of forces will equal zero. And what that would be is after all the propellant is expelled from the rocket in the future, we can actually write this sum of forces as zero. So if we set this term to zero and we actually um, isolate terms, try to get DVE on one side and, and actually represent it as delta V and set up an integral, what we're left with is after the integration, is Tchaikovsky's rocket equation. So I feel like this is a very compact um, uh, technique to again use uh, Newton's second law and get directly to the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. So a few quick limitations on the, uh, the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. First are the assumptions that the uh, rocket is already in a stable parking orbit or the rocket is traveling in deep space in straight line motion uh, at a constant initial speed. Okay, remember um, the limitations come in because Tchaikovsky's uh, rocket equation does not account for gravity, air drag, and max Q, or any kind of turns from zero degrees uh, from a vertical launch from the surface of the Earth to a 90 degree parking orbit trajectory as referenced from Earth. 
It's pretty straightforward to take the Tchaikovsky rocket equation, add gravity, and, and a form of thrust vector control or turns. And if we look here, this represents a rocket that would take off from Kennedy Space Center or Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, um, pointing upwards at zero degrees and actually go through turns as it goes through altitude to a parking orbit, eventually reaching a 90 degree orientation in a stable parking orbit around the Earth. Um, this actually shows a, a typical light, night launch from uh, Cape Canaveral, and you can actually see that, that same curved trajectory as it takes off and uh, makes it to a 90-degree path. Now, in 1912, Robert Goddard, um, he comes up with a similar rocket equation to Tchaikovsky. He develops it independently, and not only does he add gravity, he adds air drag. So uh, we'll see that in a later section, but... Um, just note that you can uh, take the Tchaikovsky rocket equation, add gravity, thrust vector control, and as Robert Goddard did, air drag. While we can develop an approach similar to the Tchaikovsky rocket equation and add gravity uh, to uh, solve the, uh, the change in velocity for a rocket as a function of height and this, this angle theta shown here, probably a more useful simplification is just to add 1.5 to two kilometers per second to the Tchaikovsky rocket equation delta V for estimating gravity, turns, and air drag at low altitudes. This is a dramatic simplification. It makes it much easier to actually account for a rocket taking off from uh, uh, Earth's surface. We've successfully derived the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. We've interpreted results, and we've also provided a useful tip if launching uh, a rocket from sea level to account for gravity and air drag. So at this point, uh, part two of the Tchaikovsky rocket equation is complete.